All right. Well, hello to everybody watching. I'm uh, having this conversation with Charles Jones, who I've known for a long time in the non, we met through the nonviolent communication work. Uh, and I think uh, it was early 2000s where we started to meet at uh, these longer intensive trainings with Marshall Rosenberg. Um, so, and Charles and I recently got back in touch and had a wonderful conversation. And, and, uh, and I just thought Charles would be a great person to have one of these kind of conversations with, uh, given what Charles you're doing now with this, this work that you've developed called Tenor Emotional Intelligence for Stress-Free Leadership, this new book you've written, and you've spent many years, as I'm understanding it, developing this work that it, it integrates nonviolent communication plus a number of other bodies of work. And um, yeah, I'm really just looking forward to, to getting into to what you've created there and how it applies to these two pillars of uh, conversation I like to focus on, with, which is consciousness, mindfulness, awareness, on, and also how that relates to the social political um, level of what's what's happening in the world. And I call it civilization, kind of the level of our civilization, like what, what's happening there with us humans and how, how everything connects through communication, right? How, that's uh, a lens that I, that I have for a long time. So Charles, thank you so much for being willing to come have this conversation in this way. You're, you're welcome. I'm very appreciative of you inviting me into this conversation, John. Yeah, so would you like to say, a few words yourself about uh, anything else you'd want folks to 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 know about your background and we'll get into the tenor work um but anything just a little more generally you want to say in addition to what i just said um i mean i i think uh um it, it might be uh, interesting for people to hear sort of where it came from mm -hmm. and uh for the subset of your audience that's familiar with nonviolent communication um, why that was such a strong influence on on this work, um, and perhaps you know how it differs from from nonviolent communication. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's let's yeah. start there. Just give a quick little summary of that. Um, so when I was in college uh, in the early '80s, um, I was struck by what I would later call uh, humanity's adaptive deficit disorder, or this tendency that I saw in myself and other people to persist in beliefs and behaviors that didn't serve them when just a few seconds or minutes of self-reflection would have them realize that's not serving them and have them make an adaptive change in their beliefs or behavior. And um, I was convinced uh, that this tendency wasn't uh, innate to us, but was due to some cultural uh, influence that we had picked up at some point in our development as a species. And um, I uh, created an independent project in, in college to kind of explore um, this hypothesis and kind of see if I could find the cultural root cause of this tendency of ours. And uh, I uh, came up with several hypotheses in the two years I was working on in college and, and disproved them. And that just, it, it set me on a course of studying Western psychology and philosophy, Eastern philosophy and mysticism, um, uh, getting into things like nonviolent communication, studying with a wide range of teachers, um, all you know, looking for kind of this answer to this question that I had. And uh, when I met Marshall, um, he had kind of the, the missing piece, the one piece that was kind of missing from the puzzle. And um, within an hour of being in a workshop with him, uh, you know, something clicked for me. And I kind of intuitively in my gut knew that I now had all the pieces on the table of the puzzle. Um, and, but you know, it actually took me years to go from that kind of intuitive hit that, okay, everything's here, 
to really being able to tease it out and refine it into a scientifically testable theory and um, and a remedy for this, you know, humanity's adaptive deficit disorder. Mm. So that's kind of the arc that led to the development of the theory and method uh, in the book and the publication of the book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I read that you like over about you say thirty years in a in a sense you've been evolving this and developing it and 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 more intensely recently. Uh, and you've done a lot of work in the business community with uh, corporations, organizations, testing it in lots of different ways. It sounds mm-hmm. like really in- intense uh, a testing of this model and particularly in those areas. But I think generally too, just any sort of um, sphere of life this applies to. But you've really, your book is very much geared towards, like it's written in a way that's very user-friendly for people in, in, a, in a business or an organizational context. Uh, so um, yeah, you've done a lot of consulting work there, yeah? yeah. And training. Yes, yeah. So, you know, um, you know, I think there's, I, I've, you know, as I was developing the theory, um, it, it's one thing to develop a theory, it's another to disseminate it and um, how people adopt it and have that make a change in our consciousness and society. And so one of the questions I was in early is, you know, what do I think would be the most effective way once this whole thing comes together for me to disseminate it? And um, I found business a particularly fertile ground for that because businesses are not philosophically dogmatic. If something works, if something improves the bottom line, if something makes the organization more effective, the organization will adopt it. Um, whereas in other domains, whether it's uh, you know religion, for example, there tends to be a lot of dogma and a lot of resistance to resistance to changing beliefs or practices. So um, uh, a lot of my testing ground for this theory and its application. Uh, has been in the business domain. And there are now literally thousands of corporate employees who've been trained in this method. And, you know, where the, the test of wasn't whether they liked the ideas or not, but whether they and the people that paid for them to come to the training saw business results. Yeah, and you tie it into leadership as well. Like, it's a way to to lead, it's a, it's, or it's a way to help people with leadership skills using this, this uh, model, this paradigm of how to relate to their emotions differently. And, and, and especially in those kind of contexts, right? Emotions aren't necessarily seen in a super positive, valuable light. And yet you've given away, I think as I read your book, especially we, we talked in depth when I read your book, just like really turning that upside down in, 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 in terms of like how useful our emotions are and you've created a way that really ties specific emotions to very specific needs and then how to act on meeting those needs that really like it's incredibly valuable information that is part of leadership in any context particularly or in business included in business so that's uh that really struck me how um how powerful that could be to the kind of business culture in general, that still as much as the kind of emotional intelligence and all kinds of newer ways of thinking have come, there's still a fair amount of maybe being more accepting, but not embracing of emotion. And um, I think you've, you've given this very concrete practical way to, to see how powerful understanding our emotions can be how practical and adaptive as you're saying this adaptive way to upgrade kind of our our biological programming really and which i want to start to get into kind of how this relationship with the unconscious but let, maybe if you want to say anything about what i just said yeah yeah so um um so emotional intelligence has been a a concept uh that was popularized by a gentleman named daniel goleman and Daniel really recognized how important, um, how consequential the way we relate to our emotions, the consequences that has on people. Now, the paradigm that really he wrote the book in and um, is still the dominant paradigm in in business 
is that um, emotions are kind of risks to be managed. You know, like uh, if, if someone is anxious to the point of being paralyzed or, or um, fearful to the point of being um, to panicking uh, or angry to the point of lashing out um, in that way, then that's extremely disruptive and potentially destructive inside a corporation and to people's relationships and their capacity to get things done. So the way emotional intelligence has typically been defined is kind of being aware of where you are emotionally and then being able to manage or regulate your emotions yeah, as yeah. if these are things that, you know, they need to be tamed. There yeah, are these yeah. animalistic instincts that we have that are, arose in a different point of our evolutionary history where fear kept us running away from saber-toothed tigers, but that's not the world we live in today. So you really need to manage these emotions. And the discovery that's at the heart of this book is that's 180 degrees wrong. Um, and in fact, it's that view of emotions that keeps us emotionally stupid in a way. Um, and the, uh, um, you know, so the view here is that emotions are not these irrational drivers of reactive behavior. Um, emotions can trigger irrational, you know, reactions to situations, but it's not the emotion itself that's the problem. It's how we're thinking about the emotion. It's what we're doing with the emotion that's irrational. Mm -hmm. The emotion is actually incredibly intelligent. Yes. And... The, um, uh, and so the, um, the breakthrough for me was, um, and a, a little bit about me. So, um, my relationship, you know, uh, you know, why does anyone set forth on a project that has engaged them for well over 30 years? Um, you know, it, it, is it for, you know, to serve the world in some grandiose way? No. It's to fix myself. Um, I really struggled with emotions as a kid. And um, I had a, a mom who was very emotional. And when she was emotional, she was sort of useless. And if I uh, had a bicycle accident on the street and I came home and she would just start screaming and freaking out and I had to bandage myself. And what I really needed was for her to be rational and calm and, and composed and help me out with, uh, uh, with the gash in my leg. Um, so I began to have this kind of view of uh, kind of emotionality as a liability. Mm -hmm. So much so that my nickname in um, junior high was Spock. The, the character um, on the original Star Trek series who had risen above his emotions and, and uh, used logic and, and would not be swayed by such things. And um, at, at some point, um, actually, you know, as I was kind of uh, uh, in college, I realized, like, it's a terrible way to live. Like th there's not a lot of aliveness or excitement or whatever in that. It's kind of like you're alive from the neck up and you're like dead from the neck down. Mm -hmm. And um, th th there's just something that sat with me that kind of wasn't right about this. And that's in parallel with observing this tendency that I call the adaptive deficit order in people. And um, so when I, uh, when I met Marshall and was in a workshop with him, and he said, um, he said a couple things that kind of just like zing, you know, ding, 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 ding. Well, the first was that, you know, emotions point to needs that you're either, you know, fulfilling or not fulfilling. It's like, oh, they're indicators, they're pointers. That's really interesting. Um, and then the other thing he said is, Anytime you have a judgment of yourself or someone else, it's what's behind it is a need of yours that you're not acknowledging. And both of those kind of resonated right away. And, um, and then my gut just said, hey, this is the, 
the missing piece for solving this, you know, finding the root cause of humanity's adaptive deficit disorder and finding a solution to it. Mm-hmm. You know, so that that's kind of the, the run up on the whole thing. I appreciate you sharing a little bit of uh, some personal history vulnerability there. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I like the richness that that, that brings. Um, and yeah, as you're starting to, to, to say, and I want to, I want to underscore it just like for me, the, 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 there's a beauty and elegance of, I guess, out of this, this, uh, as, as often can happen, these life challenges. And then that leads to what our passions become. And, but the way that you've, you've done something that I, I, I'm pretty knowledgeable. I've been around the nonviolent communication world for over 20 years. And I know a lot of people, I, I don't know anybody that's done anything like what you've done to take, um, you know, these very specific emotions and tie them to specific needs. So it's like, if you're experiencing one kind of emotion, there's a particular need and there's a way you've kind of contextualized that need so that, that there's very uh, doable practical information there. And then based on that need, what you can do about it. Um, so that the, uh, there's a precision there and, and, it, and, it, and everything that kind of just makes sense. You've done it in, in your book anyways, I think with f- five different emotions and needs. Um, but there's, there's this way that everything seems to fit into this model in a really beautiful way t- to me. Um, so I just, just the way that that stands out to anything I've come across in the nonviolent communication world um, I think is a tremendous contribution. Thank, thank you. You know, um, uh, a dear friend of mine is a uh, tenured professor of psychology at a, at a major university. And um, when I started sharing the, the tenor theory of emotion and method with him, he said, you know, Charles, there's, there's nothing like this in the field of psychology. And I attribute the that you the reason that you saw saw this and other people don't is your background isn't psychology mm. your background is hard sciences mathematics computer science and um he said this and i found it you know like helped me understand kind of my own process because i it took me back to that moment when i uh, my first workshop with marshall rosenberg and when he made the claim um, okay, if you're experiencing a painful emotion, it's because there's uh, one or more needs of yours that aren't being met. And what the thought process that I went into was, um, okay, first off, you, I don't see a way to create a computational system in which um, the trigger is a need being met or not being met, there's just too many conditions of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Um, That this idea that we have a need for safety or a need for achievement, um, and we experience emotional pain when those needs aren't being met, um, it it, it structurally uh, doesn't sound right to me. Mm -hmm. Um, So that uh, that was one of the first things that showed up. The second thing that showed up was Um, in my studies of hominid evolution, you know, anthropology, um, uh, neuroscience, the, the, the way that the brain works, um, our emotions and needs would have been selected by evolution because they're what a, uh, hunter gatherer tribe needs to survive and pass its genes on to the next generation. That would be the criteria. So any of these emotions would have to have adaptive value. Any of the needs would have to have adaptive value for hunter-gatherer society, which is Mm -hmm. our genome is very, very similar to what it was back then. The pace of genetic evolution is very small compared to the pace of cultural evolution. And um, so, you know, I could take some of these hypotheses and 
run them through thought experiments. And later I found ways to have empirical experiments to see whether or not these hypotheses uh, could be falsified or not. Um, and in science, you never really prove a hypothesis. You can only disprove a hypothesis. And a hypothesis that has been uh, subjected to thousands and hundreds of thousands of observations without any of them disproving the hypothesis, we begin to accept as theory, like the Big Bang or the theory of evolution. You know, these are, um, you know, we just have no observations that are in conflict with this, with that hypothesis, so therefore we call it a theory. So I applied that same kind of scientific method uh, to, this, to this process. And, um, and so one of the first, uh, one of the big shifts was, hey, I, I don't, although I don't see a way to um, have a set of neurons learn um, what all the conditions of safety are, it would be very easy for a neural net to learn um, what situations present a threat, represent a threat, threaten the integrity or loss of something that you value, an asset, a resource that you, you need to survive and thrive. And um, it's clear that there would be adaptive value to being in emotional pain if um, if you weren't on track to protect that asset, right? So it doesn't make sense for um, evolution to give us pleasure when a need has been fulfilled uh, or, you know, pain when it isn't. It makes more sense for evolution to put us in emotional pain if we're not on track to meet a need of ours and provide us with pleasure if we are on track to meet the need. But the moment we fulfill the need, there's no, th there's no reason for us to continue getting the carrot from, you know, uh, from evolution to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to kind of bask in the, the fulfillment of, of it. And anyone that has achieved something significant knows this. You know, you, you, you work hard for a year and you, you know, win that first prize in a track meet or wh whatever it is. And you have this moment of just fantastic feeling. And the next day, it's like, uh, you know, in fact, uh, um, there is a high percentage of, um, high percentage of Olympic athletes that win gold medals experience a period of depression after meeting the gold medals. Right. It's yeah. like, now what? These neurotransmitters were keeping me totally- On track fine. to what now, right? <laughs> right, but now that I've got the trophy, you know, now what? Well, that's, you know, you gotta set your next goal to, to achieve and uh, get that dopamine release when you see yourself on track to achieve that goal. Yeah, so you've done some really interesting things with needs again very different than you know anything i've experienced in the the nvc world where so this this on track to meet a need or not on track to meet a need as you're just saying i i just think that's yeah that there's something very uh powerful about that insight to re-language it and 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 based on you know why you've done it as you just said the other is you uh, i don't think you've said it yet in this conversation but the, the, the difference in language between the need for, maybe you started to reference it, the need for safety or whatever, versus the need to, the need mm -hmm. to mitigate risk, the need to protect assets, et cetera, mm -hmm. the need to do something and, mm -hmm. and tying it into this evolutionary uh, framework, like you just said, and, and how that seems to map really well into how we've evolved. Um, and it brings up all these interesting questions for me because I am so wedded to the, this language of need for a need for kind of, and that points in a different direction than the need mm -hmm. to, which mm -hmm. is a little more action oriented. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to dig in there, but first I realize if it's okay with you, we mm -hmm. kind of 
uh, scope out a little bit to, you call this the adaptive performance system, right? The model kind of overall, a way of looking at our human functioning relating in the world. Did I say it right? The acronym is that uh, adaptive performance system? Yes, yes. So I, I was really, you know, so going back to this um, search for the root cause of our adaptive deficit disorder, um, you know, along the way, I was able to kind of diagram out uh, a model of how our subconscious and conscious minds work together with thought and emotion and needs to keep us in an upward spiral of increasing performance, right? Um, that's at a, that's what being adaptive is. Mm. And, um, and what's really cool about this is, you know, according to this theory and model, and, you know, I've, I've seen this play out a lot, um, every emotion, whether it's painful or pleasurable, um, is an opportunity to upgrade your baseline level of performance. So every emotion processed properly, and I'm interpreting these emotions as uh, messages, requests really, from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind. And if those messages are properly interpreted and acted upon, the result is a change in the programming that drives the subconscious mind. And when we think about performance, we're not in, in it's a very rare situation where we're talking about the activity of the conscious mind. Performance we're talking about um, how well your subconscious performs in a given situation. This is easy to see in sports, right? We train and train and train, and we talk about muscle memory. Uh, the, the way we train armies, you know, for war. There just isn't time to run everything through the conscious mind. The, the conscious mind is not... Uh, is not the right tool to use when you're performing. Mm. The subconscious mm -hmm. is. The conscious mind is the programming, is the programmer. It's what um, continually refines the programming of the subconscious to improve your performance. So, you know, I think part of this is, is we live in a society where we have glorified the, the conscious mind as being superior somehow to the subconscious mind. Its job is to tame and everything else. And what I offer in the book is a view of uh, a partnership between the subconscious and conscious mind. And uh, I'm, and, and for this, I'm grateful not only to Marshall Rosenberg, who talks a lot about a power over versus power under versus power with dynamic, okay? And part of nonviolent communication is to establish a power with dynamic with other people. Mm. I think that power with dynamic starts by creating a power with dynamic with your subconscious. Mm. Mm. I love it, yeah. So I, I just, I wanna uh, go even deeper into this relationship between the conscious, conscious awareness, conscious mind, and the subconscious. Uh, and, and I like to, so here I'll say a little bit about kind of my approach, and then we can, I just want to have the, have the dialogue around this. So, so I like to think of consciousness, that word consciousness is, is, is a word that encompasses both the unconscious and the conscious awareness that we experience being aware, aware of our own awareness, right? this, whether it's an illusion or real, a sense of choice. Um, so that, but that all of that is sort of consciousness taking form and either it's either happening outside of awareness or what we are aware of. And, the, and then the, as you're talking, the relationship between awareness and the unconscious. So I use the word unconscious as also a bit broader than just subconscious. To me, subconscious has a particular kind of meaning within that maybe larger field of like kind of the unconscious, the way that say Freud and Jung talked about the unconscious, 
depth psychology talks about the unconscious. Um, there's also people talk about super conscious, that something sort of our higher self, a higher power that maybe we have access as to as part of our unconscious, uh, the unconscious that we're in relationship with. And I often think of whether it's emotions or it's thoughts that we can experience that as sort of these appearances, these visitations from the unconscious that come to us. So like a conversation between these two realms and that communicate. So it's communication, communication maybe that's happening in the unconscious and then it makes its way into the conscious, or maybe it's communication between the unconscious and the conscious as you've kind of been alluding to in terms of your adaptive performance um, system model. Um, but I've, I find this really uh, fertile ground really to, to look at um, what is consciousness? How do we understand what consciousness is and the biggest sense of that word? And that how do we use that to overcome our limitations? So you've, you've created a very, very practical way to do that um, in terms of this relationship between subconscious and conscious. But to me, it's also like, I'm really fascinated by the bigger questions around these terms and what these terms are pointing to and what the different relationships are. So having, you know, me saying that, is there anything that, that stimulates in you? And fine if it doesn't, um, but um, that, that's just interesting territory for me, even you know, beyond what you're saying, but can you tie it into anything that, that triggers for you, me saying this? Sure, sure. I, um, so a, a distinction in cognitive psychology um, is uh, uh, system one versus system two. And system one, um, a, a, good, a good source for this would be like Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. And system one thinks very fast. It's the pattern recognition machine, which is always on and is processing hundreds of thousands of pieces of information per second. So for, for you and I, our, uh, we're, we're paying attention to uh, the appearance of each other on the screen. We might occasionally start paying attention to thoughts we might have in uh, response to what's being elicited from the other person and whatnot. But our subconscious is far, far more aware of uh, everything that's happening in the room, uh, an insect crawling up the wall, you know, et cetera. It's, it's aware of a tremendous amount more than our conscious mind has the capacity to focus in and attend to at any given moment. And so um, it needs to be very, uh, um, because the conscious mind has such a limitation, uh, any, somewhere between 40 and 50 pieces of information per second is what the conscious mind is capable of processing. Mm -hmm. And so if, the, um, if our unconscious or subconscious, whatever word you want to use there um, were to share everything that it's aware of, all the sensations in our body, everything it's hearing, what's outside the window, the rumblings in the tummy, if we would share all that all the time with our conscious mind, we'd be totally overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people sometimes have this experience, for instance, if they take, um, it, if they take a substance like psilocybin or LSD, which reduces the activity of the default node network in the brain, whose job it is to make sure that the only things that reach the conscious mind is something that would be relevant and useful to the conscious mind, given the task at hand that it's focused on. Mm -hmm. right. So, and, you know, when our conscious mind is focused on something, it can literally ignore everything else. It can ignore those rumblings in the tummy or the thirst that we experience or whatever it is in order to stay focused on the task. And so the, the, the subconscious needs some mechanism by which to send up a red flag and say, hey, I know you're busy. I know you're engaged in something, but you, you have this extremely narrow sense about what's going on. 
I meanwhile am attending to all these needs of yours and all the data that might be relevant for any of these needs. Mm -hmm. And I've got a high priority interrupt here. Mm -hmm. That spider could be a black widow and you know could, could represent a threat to you. So I am going to send up a flare of fear mm -hmm. to get your attention. So I see these emotions as calls for conscious attention. Painful emotions are urgent, pressing, you know, I don't care what you're doing up there. I, the subconscious, need your attention mm -hmm. because this is, uh, we're not on track to fulfill a need here. Yeah. And, our, and how I know how to fulfill this need isn't doing the trick. I need you, the conscious mind, to reflect on the situation and do a course correct. Yeah. You know, and um, the pleasurable emotions are much easier to ignore. They're more like, hey, uh, we're on track to fulfill a need here. Um, and if, if you have a little bit of bandwidth and can put some attention here, we can strengthen the subconscious programming that's leading to us fulfilling this need so that we consolidate what we've learned and, and strengthen the things. And so we do more of what works going forward. But if you're, if you're otherwise busy, you can just, you know, kind of lightly ride this wave of feeling pleased or empowered or whatever it might be. Yeah. So you're, you're kind of describing this partnership. Yeah. And, and is it, you, what I really like if I'm understanding right is you, it's not either, or it's not that the, that the subconscious or the unconscious is completely in control of everything. And we're just along for the ride and we have no purpose. Consciousness kind of has no purpose. Some people take that position, but then on the other hand, it's not saying, well, the conscious mind is where it's all at and it's, we're completely in control and we're deciding everything. It's not, you're saying, and I don't know if you've said it yet directly today in this conversation, but that, that the behavior yeah, you alluded to it, that, that our behavior for in a large part is happening, that the subconscious is, is leading us to behave in certain ways. And then it's also sending up these emotional messages to us. And then we as conscious awareness, if we're smart enough, we can use that information to then help course correct and support the overall adaptivity, the upgrading of behavior patterns and, and ways of thinking, believing, et cetera, right? So that it sounds like you, I think you've used the analogy in the book of the elephant and the rider. Uh, uh, who's that guy? Hate the uh, moral philosopher that uses that metaphor. Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt, yeah. yeah. Um, but this idea that maybe neither one is like, is, has the power over the other, but more like they both have important roles to play and that, and, your work is a lot about just giving some very practical guidance to that communication and that partnership that, that really, do you, do you see it really as a very mutual one? It's, it's not about who has more power or less power. It's really about just different realms of expertise really, or, 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 or ability and, and trying to really bring, bring that together. Is that right? Yes, very much. Very well said. Um, the, um, the so so the way I lay it out in the book um, is I, I believe you know below the level of our conscious awareness there are uh, two systems one I call the behavior machine and this is something happens in the world and because of prior learning um, we are like oh, uh, this person just cut in front of me in line. This is a situation that calls on me to activate a need to assert my right. That's my place in line. So um, this, this uh, need to assert my right of, you know, I was there first. I, I, I get to be the next one to talk to the cashier. It activates that need. And then in this behavior machine, there are also pre-programmed tactics on how to fulfill this need. Um, and before my conscious mind is even aware 
that any of this has gone on, my behavior machine might very well say, um, excuse me, I was there first. Okay, because I've learned that that works. That's worked in the past, right? So I do that automatically. Then, so I call it the behavior machine. Then on top of the behavior machine is something I call the fulfillment monitor. And the fulfillment monitor is now comparing what's happening in the world, observing what's happening in the world to see, am I on track of meeting the need to assert my right or not? And uh, it has certain criteria it uses. Again, these criteria are things that we've learned on knowing whether I'm on track or not. And so if the person says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there, and, and they, they walk behind, start walking behind me, I'm on track to assert my right that I'm the next in line, and a feeling of empowerment uh, issues from this fulfillment monitor. The fulfillment monitor is what generates our emotions. And so I start feeling a sense of empowerment. If, on the other hand, that person were to say, um, you know, you move, you lose. Or, hey, you were, you, you were, you were reading a magazine. Uh, you know, you're not paying attention. Then I have a right to be here. Then suddenly, I'm not on track to assert my right to be, you know, my place in line. And now anger arises from my subconscious to my conscious mind saying, hey, I need your help up there. You know, our standard way of, of dealing with this situation isn't working. Mm. You, you know, can you get us back on track to, uh, uh, to assert our right here? And then this top layer, which is now in the conscious mind, I call the performance tuner. So I'm really seeing it as uh, our subconscious, its role is to um, basically take care of, take care of business. Uh, using what it's learned in the past, and then also be monitoring whether how successful what we learned in the past is in this moment, and you know, uh, escalating or calling for the help of uh, support of the conscious mind, if and only when we need it. Mm. And there are a lot of situations for which the subconscious doesn't need the conscious mind's help very much. Like if you've ever driven home from work. And when you get home, you realize that not once did you think about anything on the road. Mm -hmm. Your subconscious drove home. Your conscious mind could daydream, think about work, think about what you're going to say to your wife and kids when you come home, whatever it is. Um, and that's how we operate most of the time. But we don't, you know, almost by definition, we don't observe that. What we observe are the times that our subconscious calls on us to, uh, to support it yes. and it does that with emotions yes um i'm just i'm heard that sound go off and i'm gonna make sure that doesn't happen yeah um so this is you, what you're saying there is bringing up this question i may have raised it when we had a previous conversation recently and and uh but it's coming back to me again and it, it may or may not kind of lead you to say more. Um, but I wanna I wanna see see where it might elicit that so when you said the need to assert my rights, that's one of the needs that goes with say anger, right? If we're experiencing anger, we can tie that anger directly to this need to assert a right. So and then, and for me, just the I said it in two different ways just there, that the need to assert my rights versus a need to assert a right. And I think what's embedded in your approach is you can make it very specific to me as an individual, sort of my rights and my or protecting my assets, protecting, you know, mitigating risk to me as an individual. But mm -hmm. and you can also say it in a more general way that it could apply to a universal human need, the need for any human to assert a right if you if you assess that, you know, your rights are not being being um, respected um or the, the yeah for, let's just use that right so the difference between to the need for me to assert my rights versus the need for uh the need to assert a right as a human being yeah so that way it could apply to any it applies to every human being we all have that need to assert a right if we um, believe that it's being not not respected right so that that shift to the to more universal 
is really to me deep in my practice of NVC and this kind of communication is the going from our specific awareness of how our mind is thinking and our body is feeling and the emotions, sensations and emotions to some sort of like expanding our sense of self really to a larger whole of collective, the human family, the family of life on the planet, something that's more universal, not just individual. And for me, that's related to this of, of consciousness, consciousness, not just being me and my own little awareness, but something larger that we can, just by being aware in a more expansive way, we can feel connected, right? And, and in this, in, in the nonviolent communication, we talk about connection and empathic connection. And really to me, that's just to, to this larger wholeness that we're all part of together in various levels. And so that to me is such an important part of the, the journey of communication, of how we relate to difficulties and challenges to life itself. And, and very soon I'd like to start to get into the social political level of things. But I just, yeah, anything you want to say there about like, yeah, what mm -hmm. you're talking about is very practical for a particular individual to be self-responsible, to, to, to be very adaptive as an individual, but that what about the largest, this, this ability to connect into the larger whole of, of humanity and to life and the, the power of being able to do that in tangible ways. Anything you want to say about that? Quite a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really appreciating the way you, um, um, you know, kind of, kind of laid that out. And uh, um, because many of the questions that you, you have are ones that I had when I was um, teaching nonviolent communication and, um, and having some extraordinary experiences and some feelings that I never really had before which I would, you know, uh, compassion, empathy, connection, a certain depth and, uh, and, and a sense of humanity and, and what I had in common with other human beings. So um, let me tease out kind of how I view that through this, this tenor lens. Um, so one of the, um, another influence of mine is uh, I, I studied with and worked for a gentleman named Fernando Flores in the late 80s. And he is um, generally seen kind of as the father of ontological coaching, um, where ontology refers to the ontology of language and this, this insight that there's something, there's a very close connection there's between language, consciousness, way of being there's a very uh into there's a very intimate connection and um uh people like uh heidegger and Searle and stuff uh in the last couple centuries in the west um were really tuned into this i think you can actually find going back uh uh to like the 12th century um people like uh, abhinava gupta in in india who also paid a lot of attention to the ontology of language and this relationship to, to consciousness. Mm -hmm. And when I was studying with Fernando, there, there was, um, um, while I kind of accept the basic premise of how language shapes our consciousness, mm -hmm. it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't do so, let's see, um, that misses a layer. Mm -hmm. That misses a layer. That, that, Language is operating and interacting on top of something um, biological, energetic. Okay, and to me, here's here's how I see the connection. So, I believe that. Um, so, my colleagues and I, my primary colleague is a uh, Dr. Jim Knickerbocker, um, and we have been mapping out these emotion need mappings. And, you know, so a question is, it's almost like sort of at, at the dawn of chemistry and you start like filling in the periodic table. I love that metaphor. Yeah. Right? Analogy. Um, yeah. And how many of these universal human needs are there? What, what is the human operating system? What is it comprised of? And um, 
So in the book, I lay out five. We've identified more than five uh, of these, you know, universal human needs. And the link to very specific emotions, the emotion need right. pairing, right? Correct, correct. And I think there are in the neighborhood of 80 of these, okay? But we won't know how many there really are until we kind of map them all out. And th there's various ways we could sort of test for completeness. Like the genome but, project or something like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so um, if, we, if we stay with anger, and our assertion is that anger arises when your subconscious has the assessment that you are not on track to assert a right. And um, when I share this with attorneys, they get it right away. Attorneys live in a world of rights. You know, you share with other people and it's like, well, what do you mean by rights? And um, all human beings uh, in all cultures that have been studied believe that they have rights. But what rights they believe they have varies enormously across cultures. Mm -hmm. So almost all cultures have property rights. This is my toy. You can't play with it unless I say so. Mm -hmm. This is my house. This is my spouse, right? This is my slave, mm -hmm. right? Because for much of human history, there is this notion that human being, some, one set of human beings would have the right to enslave and own other human beings. Mm. Fortunately, we largely don't share, uh, have a consensus that that's a right. But the point is that these rights are socially constructed. Okay, they're socially constructed. And many of the biggest debates are around arguments on what rights we have. Do we have a right to terminate a pregnancy in the first trimester? Does a woman have that right? Mm. Or does that, does that fetus have a right to live? Mm. Right? And I think, I, I think part, of the, um, uh, part of the polarization in our society is not recognizing that um, we all have a need to have some social consensus on what our rights are and to be in continuous dialogue about who has what rights mm. and that we all share that. We all share this need. Mm -hmm. We may have, we may be in disagreement about what, who has what rights, yeah. but that can be a source of dialogue. And it has been through this ongoing dialogue out of this sense of compassion and common humanity that we all feel a need to assert our rights, that society evolves. Yeah. That, that we continually refine what we think our rights are. Mm -hmm. And a great deal of social change is a conversation about rights. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, one of my heroes and that I you know, use as an example in the book is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, born in India, under British rule, goes and gets a law degree in London, looks around, and he sees that everyone there just accepts as if it was a God-given fact that they ought to have the right to determine the fate of their own country and ru rule their, govern their own country. And it's like, ding, 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 ding. Maybe we Indians have that right too. And he came back to India and, and he spent a great deal of his time, wasn't focused on the British. It was on inculcating in the Indian people that they had a right to govern themselves. Mm. Let me march you to the sea and, and make salt in defiance of British law. Let me start to, to, to like show you what it would be like for us to have rights and assert them, the right of self-determination. Martin Luther King very similarly, and both of them in fact, did not view anger as something that impeded rational decision-making. They both saw anger as this Jiminy Cricket that would tap them on the shoulder when they weren't on track to mm. assert the rights right. for their people, for their people. So I think there's this, I, th I think once you begin to look at things in this way, then you can begin to empathize and have compassion with any human being even if their list of rights is different than your list of rights. And you can have a meaningful dialogue about it. 
-hmm. And that, in my mind, is the basis of a society that can govern itself, of a democracy. Um, and we're just talking about one need, the need to assert rights. Let's, let's, let's go to another one, which is the need to personify social ideals. We have certain ideals in our society about how a human being should and shouldn't behave, appear, et cetera, et cetera. When we're not on track to fulfill those, we feel ashamed. Mm. When we are on track, we feel proud. And it's often, you know, an example of another social change that we've seen is when I was growing up in West Virginia, which is where I grew up, um, if you were a man and you were attracted to other men, that is shameful. You should not tell anyone that. You need to stay in the closet. You're gay. You, you stay in the closet. Meanwhile, at that same time, you know, in San Francisco in particular, there was a group of gay men who were like, hey, I think society has this wrong. I don't think the ideal should be to be heteronormative. I think the ideal should be to authentically express your sexuality and aliveness. Mm -hmm. So we need to change what's shameful to what's shameful is being attracted to people of the same gender and pretending otherwise. That's shameful, mm -hmm. right? That's the gay pride movement, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's been, in my mind, a humanizing change because it begins to, to create our social ideals or our rights, et cetera, et cetera, consistent with what it is to be human rather than consistent with someone's hypothesis on what it is to be human and how you should act as human, where that person's usually some guy, like in some distant past that yeah. said, okay, this is how we should be. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I love how as specific as your model is, it, it has in it this capacity to expand out to all of society, all of humanity, and, 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 and these conversations, these social political conversations. So let's use that to sort of springboard into that, that domain a little more fully. And you've already covered some ground there in what you just said. Um, I, I had so many thoughts as you were talking, you know, related to, to uh, what you just said about on the social level, I guess where I'm curious what you might say about, you know, what, what we're seeing in the world right now, kind of what's happening now and maybe how the, the, the approach that you're offering could, could apply to it. Um, there's, I mean, just in a kind of macro level, what I see, what I feel compelled, like a compelling theory of what's going on is that there's over like the last eight or 10,000 years, there's various civilizations that rise and then they fall. They, they overshoot their capacity or whatever, and then they, they kind of collapse. And it seems to me that at least in, in the United States, that there's this sense of collapse, of decay, of corruption, of dishonesty, of uh, it's just a lack of, you know, any care for truth or integrity on, on lots of levels, public levels. And the, the ignoring of climate change and um, these huge existential threats that we face and not dealing with that very well at all um, on the kind of the political level, the governmental level. And, um, and then this, uh, we, uh, Kind of, I primed you a little bit for for that that documentary that came out recently, the social dilemma, the impact of 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 technology and the internet and the social media of of how the algorithm algorithms are affecting our polarization and the kind of conflict. So it, it's not even that far out of the realm of possibility at this point that we could have some form of civil war break out, at least in a mild form, around this election and in the United States. So um, the, the level of discord, the level, so, you know, given all the things we're talking about, <clears throat> the relationship of 
unconscious to consciousness, the, the, the way of having conversations around universal needs and dialogue that can really expand our adaptivity on a, on a social level, right? Um, do you have any, any thoughts you want to share there of kind of ways that you see, you know, beyond what you just said of, of what, you know, given this current state of things, and maybe you have a different take on it, but, you know, what, what can we do with this kind of communication, this way humans can connect with ourselves and each other that can be much more adaptive? Um, but yeah, on that level, anything else you want to say there? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So, um, you know, when, uh, when Jim and I were talking about what to title the book, there's a, we went through quite a few titles and, um, the, um, we chose emotional intelligence to be part of the title because although our view of emotions and our view of actually what emotional intelligence is for us, emotional intelligence, isn't, you know, being able to tame these unruly emotions, but rather it's to turn every painful emotion into a springboard to higher performance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's a very different definition based on a very different understanding about what emotions are. Um, and, you know, so there's an existing, discourse there's an existing field and in industry um and that's where we kind of focused our attention and then the, the the next piece is when um as this you know as we began to see more and more looking through this lens of the relationship between emotions and needs we um we saw something really interesting um so to, if, if, if you're going to go from say, anxiety uh, to an understanding that I'm anxious because my subconscious has the assessment, I'm not on track to mitigate a risk. Then the next question is, what risk, you know, has my subconscious identified, right? Do I agree it's a risk? And um, I was anxious about environmental degradation in college, it's actually where this whole work on our adaptive deficit disorder came from. Don't we realize if we continue polluting and pumping carbon, uh, destroying the ecosystems upon which our life depends, like why isn't anyone else worried about this? I was very anxious about it. Uh, my friends, it was during the uh, Cold War, they were much more anxious about the possibility of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. I'm like, well, that may or may not happen. I don't know what to do about that. But what I'm certain is going to happen is we're gonna find ourselves in, now, I didn't have all the specifics of climate change worked out at that time, but I already had an anxiety that was like, you know, in that area. And that climate change is in fact this existential threat for humanity as I know it. It's probably not an existential threat for the top 1% who can afford to organize the world a, a, a around them, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of, of climate change or not. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly for the hopes and dreams and vision for my kid and the future generations and everything, it represents an existential threat. Mm -hmm. So um, let me leave that for a second and just go back to, to anxiety. So if, if I'm using my conscious mind to investigate why my subconscious is anxious and I identify the risk and I agree this is a risk mm -hmm. and I agree that the criteria I'm using is the right one to evaluate whether we're on track to mitigate the risk and we're not on track to mitigate the risk, mm -hmm. okay? And it's not a risk that I alone can mitigate. Mm -hmm. Me driving a Prius isn't going to do it. Me driving a Tesla is not going to be sufficient, mm. right? This is something that a large number of people are going to have to get behind. And like Gandhi, you know, taking years to inculcate awareness and understanding and a belief that this right of self-determination is one that they as a people had, likewise, you know, I don't think something will change substantially in this area 
until we have leadership uh, that is stepping forward and getting us all on the same page that climate change is an existential risk. Mm -hmm. And we need to change our tactics, a lot of our tactics, in order to get back on track to mitigate this risk. And um, the... But you're giving away maybe to, to frame the conversation that might be more effective, the perform, how to tune the performance of the conversation differently based on these distinctions. Is that right? Yes. Yes, because because now you understand that just arguing with people, you know, about, you know, you, you first of all, you have to start with the, uh, you know, do we have a shared reality? Do we less share less, yeah. assumptions that has us recognize this as a risk? And clearly we don't. We're very polarized in this, in this uh, country on whether it's man-made, whether it's a hoax, whether, you know, how severe it is. and um, and in a world in which we're not all reading the same uh, news sources, a world in which science is treated as just another opinion, when in fact, if someone understands what science is, it's not just another opinion. It is a discipline for building coherence between what we observe and what we believe. And, um, uh, you know, it's going to be very difficult to unite us as a people around the threat of climate change if half of us don't believe it's real, right? And that kind of plays into this whole idea of the social dilemma, uh, which is social media and the way most of us get our news now and uh, Fox versus MSNBC, we're all living in echo chambers where the uh, uh, the facts that are being brought to us are ones that are already consistent with our biases, mm -hmm. with, with our beliefs, and the the evidence that could potentially create the cognitive dissonance between what we're observing and what we believe to be true isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a uh, uh, to be a good scientist you need to have epistemological humility. You need to recognize you don't know everything. You need to always be willing to, to challenge and allow a new piece of information to overturn uh, a held belief. And now we're back to kind of the original thing that sent me on this path of what's the source of our adaptive deficit disorder, mm -hmm. right? And we do have, I believe we do have needs that were selected by evolution that can help us here. Like confusion. Hey, I'm confused. What I'm observing doesn't match my mental model. Uh, I'm not on track to, to update my mental model to match my observations. Mm. If we don't recognize that's what confusion is, mm. right? And instead it's like, oh, th this is confusing. I'm gonna go back to my little bubble where there's no cognitive dissonance. What I'm seeing is that it's, it's, it's scalable. Like what your, the approach you're offering, you, yes, we can apply it on the individual level to ourselves and negotiating, navigating challenges and different emotions that come up. And it's a way to have these larger cultural, social conversations in some different forms, but ways to be more adaptive instead of, of, of maladaptive in how we process that information, how we communicate about, I don't know, I just am getting kind of images of, of different um, guideposts or sources of like that more people could embrace as, oh yeah, this is maybe not what we'll believe or not, but it's like how we can talk about it that can more lead to a kind of Con coming a convergence of 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 getting some shared reality and then at least enough to take coordinated effort right but I, yeah i'm just actually seeing the more you're talking about it like uh, i'm just getting these images of oh yeah it it does scale like gandhi or it does scale to 
these much larger conversations. Um, yeah, yeah, that's actually giving me a lot of uh, some, ex I'm noticing the emotion of excitement arising, Charles. Uh, I think a, a, a need, for the moment, my, my subconscious is assessing some on-trackness of a way to support the current dismal state of affairs we're in at the moment you laid out yeah yeah the the um you know so process is an interesting word here so um when i think about the implications of the social dilemma and uh, for those of you watching who haven't seen it i it's it's the most profound film in my mind that i've seen in many years um and i had um you know I, I've been certainly aware of the statistics of depression and anxiety in generations that grew up when social media was um, the tool they were using at the stage of development, when we learn how to socialize, when we learn how to belong outside of our family, when we're teenagers and we're shifting from uh, this, um, maybe to back up, if you go back to hunter-gatherer times, what's the single deepest, most important human need? It's belonging. You don't belong, you don't survive. You don't procreate. Your genes don't make it to the next generation. Belonging is at the core of what we are as a human being. It's our deepest human need. It's not a need we need to fulfill to survive in a modern society. But it still lives there as a need. And here are, you know, our children are, are you know, entering uh, the age at which they begin to shift their, their strategy for belonging from their parents and uh, to their peers. And the primary medium through which th that's happening is social media. Mm. And so if, that medium itself is not supporting the, the process that's going to lead to uh, belonging and solidarity as a people, as a, as a tribe, but rather is going to fracture and fragment, distort yeah. what it is to belong into finding your way into a set of people that share the same set of beliefs that you do about the world, ceasing to have dialogue with those that have a different perspective, and where those perspectives, there just aren't very many of them. You know, if, if uh, you interview uh, people before they identify as Democratic or Republican, and you get their opinions on a wide range of issues, no one is... 100% in one camp or the other. Mm -hmm. But once they identify themselves as Democrat or Republican, mm -hmm. that need for belonging causes them to shift all their other perspectives mm -hmm. so that they're right in line with these diametrically opposed, each shallow in their own way, each lacking a certain kind of nuance in its own way. And I agree with you. That's a formula for civil war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground. I love the way you articulated all this. You kept bringing out the, some nuances of, of the work. Um, seeing the, the time, how about start to kind of wrap up a bit? Uh, I noticed in me the wanting to tie things all the way back to the discussion of consciousness and awareness, mindfulness, and then using that to inform language communication um, internally and then externally. So like something about, um, for me anyways, it, you know, how do we, how do we upgrade our capacities ultimately, I think, to, to be, um, to be more, to be more aware so that we can utilize like your approach is called tenor t-e-n-o-r to use tenor and things like that 
Um, but I think, yeah, awareness comes first, right? You have to be aware enough to notice your tense, what emotions are there, connecting. It all takes a, 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 lot of, a lot of awareness, a lot of mindfulness. And then maybe consciousness can be this sort of more and more like what's in our unconscious and what's in our aware, like all that maybe we see as more of one whole, like we're not too separate, unconscious, conscious, but yes, at one level, yes, the duality of that. But then what I really love is the concept of non-duality of kind of, so then there's maybe just the consciousness that exists in us in these different modes and how that actually we're part of this larger field of consciousness that is everybody. And how do we, how do we come together in these practical ways you and I've been talking about, but ultimately for me, it's, it's this, yeah, this being able to really inhabit, embody or experience our inter being, our interconnectedness, our, our larger oneness in this, in this, um, in connection is how we're connected. So, that's kind of how for me it all ties together. And, um, but I love all these very practical ways to, to try to do things personally and collectively. So anything you want to say in closing? Yes. Yeah. So, so, um, so on this idea that um, what we're conscious of is what we're giving our attention to and that emotions call for our attention mm. and most, um, you know, when, emo when an emotion is calling for our attention, uh, there's a couple things here. Um, one is where, how we interpret that emotion, what we believe the cause of that emotion to be will dictate where our attention goes. So if, for example, um, we experience some anger and we believe that the reason we're angry is because those Democrats or those Republicans or whatever are doing X, Y, Z, okay? Then all of our attention, our consciousness is now focused on like what's going on with them and what's wrong with them and, and, and why we're better than them or et cetera. It, it sends us down this, this, this road of negativity. Yes. Negativity yes. isn't inherent to a painful emotion. It's inherent to misattributing the cause of the emotion to something out there in the world. Yes. If instead that anger triggers us to turn our attention toward our need to assert our rights and what right is at play here? And, oh, everyone has a need to assert rights. It's an immediately, it's a softer experience. It's no longer filled with negativity. It's filled with humanity and an appreciation for diversity, a diversity mm. of perspectives and whatnot. Mm. So that one shift in consciousness, that one attentional habit, yes. based yes. on a shift in our understanding of what emotions are, what cause emotions, to me, that's huge. Yeah. So, so that, that, that would be one. I, another one here, a topic we haven't talked about at all, and you know, maybe this will this could be a topic of an, another conversation entirely. Is um, there's been this kind of growing awareness and recognition that there's a lot more trauma in our society than we ever thought there was, whether it's survivors of childhood sexual abuse or it's veterans coming home from war, right? Those are the most kind of um, um, highly charged kind of examples. But there's this kind of growing recognition that, that trauma is much broader than that. And uh, the way I view trauma in terms of the adaptive performance system is an individual is uh, being flooded with a painful emotion that they have no capacity as the small child or the person in the constant state of war, they, they don't have the resources, they don't have the resourcefulness to um, process that emotion and get themselves back on track to fulfill their need. Mm. And their conscious mind is being overwhelmed by, flooded by this emotion. Mm -hmm. So they just shut it down. They just like, look, I, I can't hear from you right now. 
yeah, I know you have something important to say to me, but I just can't handle it. So I'm going to ignore you and, and hold you at bay, yes. suppress awareness of you. Yes. And when we suppress awareness of an emotion, that creates tension in our body. We do it intensely enough and repetitively enough, we actually succeed in kind of pushing that emotion offline. Yes. Okay, so now I don't have to be overwhelmed with fear. Or I don't have to be overwhelmed with anxiety. The problem is, then you also aren't getting the messages from your subconscious about when you're not on track to protect an asset. Cuts off, cuts off other communication. You're at a risk. You, you, you're literally not playing with a full deck anymore. Mm -hmm. you, 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 some of your needs are now offline. Yes. And you become blind to them. Yes. Right? And so I think another part of consciousness is like, how do we begin to in, engage? I think most of our trauma isn't personal. It's societal. Mm -hmm. It's collective. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's stuff that we share. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. cultural. And behind that dissociation or the suppression of those emotions are these life-serving, society-serving needs. So if we want to stay in a process of, of moving toward greater effectiveness and fulfillment and wholeness as individuals and as a society, we also need to address that. We need to address these things that are kinks in our consciousness that are turning off these spigots of awareness. Not allowing that communication to happen. Yeah. 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 There's actually a really wonderful online summit right now that's finishing this week uh, on collective trauma, collective trauma summit organized. With Thomas Hubble. Thomas Hubble. Yeah. I've yeah. been, I've been looking at some of that. It's really wonderful. So yeah, there's generational trauma. There's all kinds of ways to look at trauma and uh, yeah, we're great to have another conversation about that. So just to, to kind of wrap up, uh, again, I recommend people get Charles's book, Charles and Jim, Emotional Intelligence for Stress-Free Leadership. I really, it's, it's not very long and it's super well-written and just, uh, it's a great read and, and um, gives like the how to do what we've been talking about. And uh, in the sort of description, Charles, there'll be information about um, getting a hold of you and things like that. Anything you want to say about how people can, reach you if they want to? Sure, sure. So Jim and I have a website, um, tenormethod.com, T-E-N-O-R-M-E-T-H-O-D.com. And um, uh, you can find some stuff there that uh, you might find useful. Um, we're, we're really targeting the, uh, the business, the, the workplace, organizations, uh, uh, businesses, um, because those are ready-made communities. In our experience, it's much easier to do this kind of work of um, basically transforming your relationship to emotion and in turn to your subconscious and your needs and, and entering into that partnership. And um, you know, what we've seen is kind of the way someone treats their subconscious is often the way they'll treat their subordinates as a leader. Mm -hmm. You know, is it a power over, is it a power with model? Mm. right um and so uh, uh you can find that there but the book is um most ex many examples are business but i think as you can attest john the the book works great for someone who's in self-development or life coaching you know um and the the method is being used by a number of executive coaches um and they find it extremely powerful especially for coaching leaders, because the job of a leader is really to take these emotions, to take these messages from the subconscious of, say, anxiety or fear, and figure out what asset we need to protect and what risk we need to um, mitigate. mitigate or what goals we need to achieve. Figuring out what to do is the job of leadership. Mm -hmm. Actually doing it is more management. Mm. It's a classic distinction made by um, uh, Drucker, Peter Drucker, that leaders, you know, uh, are about what to do, and uh, managers are about, you know, do the right thing, 
And what's the right thing to do versus doing the thing right, you know, for, for a manager. And it's why we positioned the work for, for leaders, because that's the job of leadership. So a leader should not be a Spock and ignore their emotions, go above their emotions. A leader is the person that can translate the emotions in themselves and others, the population that they serve and, and lead, and translate that into what goals we need to achieve, what assets are most important to protect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Charles. I love this conversation. I'm guessing it'll be quite valuable to people to listen to. So thank you again for doing this. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, turn off our recording here. And oh, thank you, John. It's, it's really been an honor. Uh, you're, you're very, uh, you're very um, skillful in the way that you moderate the conversation and, and very easeful to dance with. And, so I really enjoyed and appreciated the conversation. Mm, yeah, me too. Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording here.